The Sleepaway Camp series is one of the more controversial out there, mostly because of its first entry being a trailblazer in the world of gender bending. But when you look past the first film, the sequels get to a place of absolute insanity. While we've covered the second one on this show in the past, and that one is often the one that gets the spotlight, yet its sister sequel was filmed at the same time and released just one year later, and is nearly just as insane. So join us today on Real Slashers as we get into all of Angela Baker's psychopathic exploits as we cover Sleepaway Camp 3, Teenage Wasteland. Ironically, Camp New Horizons was formerly known as Camp Rolling Hills, where last year 19 people were brutally slain by alleged psychopath Angela Baker. The film picks up one year after the second one left off, and for those that may have missed it, Angela Baker poses as a camp counselor and murders the entire camp until there's no one left. Yet somehow she's able to escape and the camp is trying to open just one year later. Angela takes the place of another girl and poses as Maria. Camp Arawak, or Rolling Hills, is now Camp New Horizons, and it's got an interesting gimmick. They're bringing together rich and poor kids. Yeah, that's the long and short of it, and it's just as strange as it sounds. They say they want to make sure that they can share properly and communicate. Okay then. Even the news thinks that opening up the camp is nuts and is looking to cover it. The local newswoman makes the mistake of asking Angela to get her some cocaine. It still cracks me up that this girl thinks that this camp in the middle of the woods is the best place for her to score some coke. Hell, she's going back to the city later that day. Just wait a bit. Instead, Angela gives her some Ajax cleaner, and she shows the importance of testing your drugs before you do them. Brutal. The campers get separated into three different groups, with the intention that they'll all come together after a couple days. But Angela doesn't let them get to that point, murdering everyone in her group, then moving on to another one, and then another one until there's no one left. Angela really has a problem with excess. When Angela is killing one of the counselors, we find out that this is the father of one of the boys from the last film. But even him being on to Angela just isn't enough, as he's off the moment that it's revealed that he knows who she is. It's honestly hilarious. You'll also notice that I haven't really talked about the final girl here. And it's not because we don't have one. We do, and her name is Marsha but she feels rather irrelevant to the story, despite the fact that she actually stabs Angela in the end. But she spends most of the film wooing and trying to hook up with Tony, and she hardly has anything to overcome because it's all over so quickly. Not exactly final girl material. There's a nice little tag featuring Angela in the back of an ambulance. It's mostly just a way to get a couple more kills in, but it continues the absurd fun that the film loves to have. I mean, just look at this. Hey, what's going on back there? Just taking care of business. You look a little older than the rest. Massive drugs. You wouldn't know where I can uh, score some coke. Yeah, there's a machine in the dining hall. <laughs> I said it in my unhappy camper video, but I actually prefer Pamela Springsteen's version of the character, as she seems to just be having an absolute blast in the role. I love the glee in her eyes as she's doing any form of murder. And despite Springsteen looking like she's aged a bit between films, two and three were filmed over a six week period. So it's apparently all in the hairdo. While the unhappy camper version of Angela Baker is still my favorite, the Teenage Wasteland version has a certain edge to her that is cannot miss. The way she just moves from person to person, almost as if she can't help herself. If the opportunity to kill someone presents itself, then she is going to take it, goddammit. Unfortunately, most of the kills in the film were either cut by the MPAA or just cut due to budgetary concerns. And I'm not sure what it is about slashers released in 1989 having very weird age-defying pairings, but that continues here with camp owner Herman hooking up with Jan. 
This is also a nice little throwback to the just as weird relationship with Meg and Mel in the first film. I just wish their deaths had been a little more memorable than just a whack in the head with a stick. There are plenty of scenes to look at, but there's just something about this opening. And why does the fact that she's going to camp literally mean anything? Just do what your mom asks and turn down the damn radio. You going to camp affects nothing. But I guess there's only so much I can expect from a girl who has milkshake tattooed on her chest. This woman is clearly classy as hell. She heads out with her full denim outfit and massive hair, ready to go to camp. It's just so funny because nothing about this girl screams camp, yet she seems so pumped about it. Probably just happy to get away from her wonderful parents. She's walking along and suddenly we see an angle from a big garbage truck. Only nothing really seems too out of the ordinary, so it's kind of shocking when Maria just throws her bag down and decides to run from it. But it turns out that's a good thing because, you know, despite there not being any sign of it prior, the truck is after her. So rather than, you know, going to some place that the truck can't reach her, she stays in the middle of this alley, just asking to get run over. And wouldn't you know. This is when the truck driver gets out and we see that it's Angela. She's dressed exactly like the girl. Um, how did she manage to do this? I mean, I get the hair. She could have scoped her out beforehand. But the whole outfit, too? It's the kind of thing that makes no sense, and that just makes the scene even better. Which is good, because it follows it up with this insane shot of the camp bus swinging by to pick her up, and then the absurdity just continues with some new graffiti claiming that Angela is back. Yes, she is. Why are you doing this to me? Because you're a cheerleader, a fornicator, a drug taker, a nasty, snotty bigot. And besides that, you're real nice. Sleepaway Camp 3, Teenage Wasteland, released straight to video in the United States on December 15th, 1989. While the release did well enough in rentals, it wasn't until Anchor Bay's Sleepaway Camp Survival Kit released that the movie became must-own. As with the other two films in the series, Scream Factory released the film on Blu-ray and did a wonderful job remastering it. With how much they've been upgrading their catalog to 4K, it's only a matter of time before we get this series in glorious 4K. And I for one can't wait. Can you imagine this movie in 4K? Oh, I need that detail. One of the most interesting aspects of the film is who wrote it. Because you probably recognize this character actor. Michael Hitchcock is that guy in so many different comedies yet he started off in the world of horror. He wrote both the sequels under the pseudonym Fritz Gordon. As someone who is a fan of the actor from all of his appearances in Christopher Guest movies, this was an absolute shock to learn, as the Sleepaway Camp series has been firmly in my life since I was a teenager. If only I knew who Fritz Gordon was. Yes, those are lights. Could they fall? And that's a ceiling above us. But they look shaky. No, they're not shaky. They're it's perfect. It's like that wire. I see a wire. I see it. Ow! While there are other movies that came after, I'd consider Sleepaway Camp to be the end of the series, as the other sequels are much better forgotten. Because despite it being the worst of the first three, it still provides plenty of entertaining moments. I mean, hell, I could watch Pamela Springsteen murder teenagers with a big ol' smile on her face all day long. Because if there's one thing that's missing from too many horror films these days, it's the killer having a grand old time. And no one quite knows how to party like Angela Baker. Well, you're just gonna cut my head off like you did my son's. What's it gonna be? A gun. 